3.2. Section 3.2 is, uh, is about the mean variance theorem. Now, what is the mean variance theorem? Let me state it there. First of all, we assume the function, yeah, the mean variance theorem. The mean variance theorem says that if the function, uh, if the function is continuous on a closed interval and uh, differentiable on this open interval, then, then, then the difference, this ratio, this is called the average rate of change. This is going to be the derivative of, of the function for some c in the interval, in this interval. Now, what does that mean? Right? The proof is simple. Okay? The proof is simple. And here's the argument. Okay? This is a proof. So suppose a picture, this is a graph, right? And uh, what's the meaning of the, of the ratio on the left-hand side? That is uh, the slope of this P and the Q. M, P, and the Q is going to be this. All right, so this quotient is going to be the slope of this secant line, okay? Right? Yeah, so super this CM because the coordinates of this point is A and the F of A, and this point is a B and the F of B, right? So take the difference of Y coordinates divided by the difference of X coordinates that gives the slope of the secant line. Then you move this secant line parallel, right? And you find out there's another line parallel to the secant line but tangent to the curve, right? Definitely, you can see that. So that point called the C at that particular point. And uh, the slope of this tangent line is going to be the derivative of, a, of, the, of the function, right? Since they're parallel, that should be equal, right? M, P, Q should be equal to M because they're parallel. Okay, that's a proof. So that gives you the above. Uh, uh, argument uh, about theorem, yeah. So that's called the uh, the mean variance theorem. Mean variance theory also tells you some information. For example, uh, f of t is a position function, right? And uh, and you can talk about the average velocity, average of speed. When you drive from uh, in the number of the bromine, right? The average speed is maybe 60 miles per hour, for example. Okay, that's the average speed. So what, what you do that is the, the difference of the position divided by the time. That gives the average speed. But this theorem says that the average speed must be equal to the speed at some point. Okay, so if you drive, if the average speed is 60 miles per hour from in the number of the bromine, then somewhere your speed must be 60 miles per hour, okay? If you derive continuously, the speed change continuously. Uh, why? Because you can, if you're always above 60 miles per hour, the average speed will be about greater than 60, right? Miles per hour. So, so that's this is obvious, right? This, okay? Now, uh, we are going to, now uh, we have a bunch of uh, uh, exercise to verify this theorem, okay, using the examples. Verify the mean variance theorem for the function fx equals x cubed minus 2x squared plus minus 4x plus 2 on the interval from negative 2 to positive 2, okay? What does that mean? That means to do this type of problems, you have to write down what you have to do, okay? You have to write down that. 
according to the mean variance theorem. F of two minus F of negative two divided by two minus negative two is going to be the derivative of the function for some C in the interval from negative to positive two, right? So you have to verify that there are such C there, okay? okay. So you, step one, you calculate the one uh, on the left-hand side, you have to calculate the derivative, then you find a C. So there should be a number C in the interval between zero two and positive, negative two and positive two, so that this is equal, okay? So we, we do the calculation, okay? F of two, uh, this is a, an odd function, okay? This is an odd function. Yeah, let me look at the f of two, okay? f of two is two cubed minus two times two squared minus four times two plus two, okay? So what do you get? What do you get? I think a two cubed, right? Uh, two, this two cancel out and this is going to be negative six. Then I have a look at the negative two. So it'd be negative two cubed minus two times negative two square minus four times negative two plus two. So let's calculate that. Negative eight minus minus positive, yeah, it's negative eight plus eight plus two. Okay, right, so that's canceled out, still negative six. So this ratio on the left hand side is going to be negative six minus negative six. It's going to be zero, okay? So we have to find the derivative. So derivative function is 3x squared minus 4x minus 4. So the theorem says that zero should be equal to f plus c, which is 3c squared minus 4 times c minus 4. Okay. So in other words, you have to find a c such that this whole. Okay. Uh, how can I find this? Use a quadratic formula. C is going to be, right, 2b, not 2a, negative b plus minus b squared minus 4ac. Right. So I think I'm going to get four square. I can take it out. Four and then have four. I think it's it's gonna be four times two is eight. Okay, so there are two solutions. If it's plus twelve divided by six, two, if minus will be minus two over three. Okay. So there are two solutions, two and a negative two over three. But we are looking for the number in the interval from, uh, from negative two and the positive two inside the interval. So my C is going to be negative two over three. This is the in the interval. The right. other two is on bound. Right. So we verified the theorem without proving the theorem. We verified for this particular function, the average rate of change is going to be the value of the derivative somewhere in the interval. Okay? So let me state the theorem. Yeah, f of 2 minus f of negative 2 over 2 minus negative 2 is going to be f prime negative 2 over 3. Okay? So we verify this statement uh, the of the mean value theorem for this particular function. Okay. So let's take a look at the next problem. F of x equals one over x plus x. This is on the interval from negative one half of two. Now look at this function. I think this function is continuous and differentiable on this interval. So f is continuous on the interval and also differentiable on this closed interval. Right? Clear, right? 
because x is away from zero. According to, by the mean value theorem, we should have a number, yeah, by the, uh, by the mean value theorem, there is a number c in this interval such that the difference equals the value of the derivative somewhere. Okay. So let's verify this statement. If we find some function, it's not true. That means what? That means the theorem is wrong. Okay, as long as you find a single example, okay, which satisfies the conditions in the theorem, but the conclusion is incorrect, that means the theorem is not called the theorem, it's fake one. Okay? Yeah, you cannot call the theorem. So some mathematicians publish your papers and the competition is complicated, so people just accept it. And that's user his user his credit, okay? <laughs> And later on, some graduates spend more time in you know, some advice. I said, hey, please read this paper, it's important. The students spend a lot of time in a couple of months and they figure out, hey, that's wrong. But how do you argue with that? Sometimes they'd be very careful. I'm not sure I'm right. But then you find a kind of example, a kind of example. And an example is easy to check. And then it's wrong. You don't need to go through the proofs again. So like sometimes 100 pages. It's very hard to, who is going to waste the you know, couple of months, right, to prove fine. So if as long as you have a kind of example, then you don't need to waste time to read the rest of it. All right, so that happens sometimes. Okay. So let's do this. Uh, yeah, let's do this, okay. Uh, now if we cannot find the kind of example, and if you still think the proof is not clear. We can only say there's a gap in the proof, you know, jump from one step. We cannot immediately claim that's the wrong theorem, okay? So let's look at this. Okay, first of all, we have to find, uh, when we do some preparation. We need to verify this, right? We have to find uh, the, the value of the functions. You also have to find the derivative. Okay, let's do the value of the function first. F of two is one half plus two. That's gonna be five or two f of one half, uh, it's probably the same. So it's two plus one half, it's going to be five or two. So clearly the difference is going to be zero. Okay. Then the derivative of the function is going to be negative one over x squared plus one. Okay. According to the above identity, then you have to have a five over two minus five over two, and here two plus one over two should be equal to f prime c. So that's going to be negative c squared plus one, right? You have to find a such c. So look at, look at, yeah, look at this is zero equals negative one over c squared plus one. How do you solve this equation? Well, you move a one over c to the left hand side. So this is the same as c squared equals one. C is going to be plus minus one because this is a we are looking for a number in this interval and you have one solution. Okay, so we very find the we very find the theorem. Yes, no problem for this particular function. The theorem still true. The statement. I don't need to look at the proof. His argument. Okay, I just needed to look at. Uh, a couple examples, find out if these examples are uh, correct. Now in mathematics, this is still not called proof, okay? If you use a few examples to check the statement is correct, that's not proof. You cannot publish the theorem, say I have a theorem, and this is true. Now because I see, I show you, I randomly pick up two or three functions, that's still okay. <laughs> but that's still not proof, you cannot prove it. But in biology, it's a proof, okay? If you did an experiment three times, you find out it's the same, and then claim it's true, okay? Uh, uh, yeah, but that's just, you know, this is, it's a stand away. So mathematics is not called a science, biology is called a science. <laughs> yeah, some, some, there's some small difference. 
Alhamdulillah. Yeah, one day I was wondering why the math department called Department of Mathematical Sciences. I don't wonder why not simply called Department of Mathematics. <laughs> right, you know, you're wondering why make it simpler. You know? Okay. So take a look at the next problem. Same function. Okay, let's look at this function on the interval from negative one to positive. Okay. So I'm going to use this function, okay, to check. We're going to check, yeah, to check the, to verify the, 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 the mean value theorem using this example. So let's first of all, let's look at f of one minus f of a negative one divided by one minus negative one. So I get one, one plus one of one, right? Minus negative one plus this, and denominator is two. So what I get, I think the numerator I get uh, four, right? So that this is a two. And then I look at the derivative. It's so one minus one of x squared. No problem. Okay. So I know I know f of one minus f of a negative one divided one minus negative one should be equal to f prime c, right? So that means two should be equal to one minus one of c squared. Okay. Let's try to see if we can find such C. C is in the interval from negative one to positive, all right? If the mean theorem varies true for this function, okay? Yeah, let's, let's solve this equation, solve it for, for C, okay? Then let's see, one over C squared equals negative one c squared equals negative one, no solution. Then say, oh great, this theorem is wrong. I'm going to publish a paper. Okay, here's my kind of example. Now you said that I did not, I did not understand your proof of that mean value theorem, but here's my kind of example. <laughs> right? <laughs> it's wrong. But one thing is important here. You did not check whether your function satisfying the assumption because everything is true is under some assumption okay and the assumption the assumption is the function should be continuous and it should be differentiable and clearly yeah so first of all you have to say is a mean value theorem does not uh, does yeah does not hold for for this function okay uh, on the interval, yeah, the reasons why, you know, right? You have to give me the reason why. Yeah, it does not hold for this function on the interval from negative to Why? Okay. Why? Because f of x is discontinuous even on the interval from uh, it continues at x equals zero. But then you say, okay, the function is not defined, right? Then how about how about this function? It's not discontinuous. I I just define x is, you know, the function is not defined even, right? You can say x equals zero when x equals zero, but right? even that is still discontinuous. This, okay, this function, I forgot, you know, the function should be defined everywhere. 
So you can assign the value for the function at zero. But this function is still discontinuous. Okay, so you cannot apply, we cannot, yeah, this f, this function f still, uh, uh, yeah, it's still discontinuous at x equals zero, okay? So we cannot apply the theorem to this function. Okay. So when we when we start the function, we have to make sure the function is continuous and differentiable. Otherwise, it's harder to yeah. Otherwise, the theorem is no longer true. Right, let's talk about the application of, uh, of the mean value theorem. Okay. Suppose that the derivative of a function is always between 3 and 5 for all x. Right? But I also know that the value of the function equals 0. Estimate f of 3 and f of 8, okay? Can you give me some estimate? Uh, f of, uh, f of, uh, f of, uh, f of 1, okay? Just not 3, f of 3. All right, let's get some estimate. I know the derivative is not constant, but it's, there's a range, okay? Three and uh, five. And I know the value of the function is zero. Then can I estimate the value of f of everything? Just use the mean variance theorem. The mean variance theorem says that, right? It's going to be the derivative of some function, right? Okay? But the derivative I know is between three and five. So, f of eight minus zero divided by six, this is already derivative. It's less than or equal to five, greater than or equal to three. So I can get this estimate, <clears throat> okay? So the value of a function is between 18 and 30, according to the theorem. You can also look at f of two minus f of one, two minus one. It's less than, this is going to be the derivative also for some function. C is in the interval from zero to two, uh, right from one to two, okay? By the mean values there. Okay. Uh, you know the values between uh, the derivative is being 3 and 4. So f of 2, okay, f of 2 is going to be what? It's going to be 0. We already know that. It's between 5 and 3. Okay. So f of 1, if we change the direction, we encode it. Right, so f of 1 is between negative 3 and negative 5. So we got such an estimate for the value function. So the derivative indeed can choose the, the function with some. Right. And this exercise shows that if the derivative is always, always equal to zero, then f of x is a constant. Why? Okay. I don't know the uh, interval, right? Identical zero, so it means identical zero in the interval, in some interval i. Okay, 
and and open integral, right? Then the function is constant. Why is this constant? Well, how do you prove it? You can take an arbitrary point, fix an arbitrary point. Okay, here's a proof. Fix an arbitrary point. Okay, then f of x minus f of zero divided by x minus x there, right? This was according to the mean variance theorem, it's going to be f prime c. Now, what is c? C is between x0 and x, some number, right? The mean variance theorem says that. But this is always equal to zero. We already know that the derivative is zero. So that means the numerate is always equal to zero. That means the function is always equal to f of x. So it's constant. It's independent of x. So as corollary, yeah, we have to show that uh, so uh, if we know if uh, you know these two functions have the same derivative for all x in the interval, right? then they only differ by a constant. Okay, see the constant. If they have same derivatives, why well, there must be a, uh, they differ by constant. The proof is simple. All you have to do is just look at the difference. The derivative of that difference is going to be f prime x minus g prime x. It's going to be zero, right? So something the derivative zero, then this is going to be constant. Okay, it's constant. Okay. So our next question. Determine all the functions uh, f of x satisfying satisfying this equation. Now, to determine all the functions, you just need to find the what. Because if another function satisfies the same equation, then they differ by constant. Okay, so so by guessing, try. I think the f of it, yeah, the first one uh, is yeah. We we know that. How can I figure it out? Okay, I remember this is the f of this right. It's going to be a x to the a minus. All right. So let's try a, a minus one equals two. So a is going to be three. So in other words, the derivative of x cubed is going to be three x squared, right? So I divide both sides by, by three. I get x squared. So x squared comes from the derivative of one of x cubed. So my first then you can say f of x is going to be one third of x cubed, right? 
Now that's just only one particular solution. You ought to get all the solutions. I think it just need to add a constant, right? Because if uh, if uh, if uh, there is another function have the same derivatives, then the difference of those two functions must be constant. Right. So that's why just need to find the one and it's enough. So this is uh, uh, the derivative is always zero, then then the function must be constant. Now we have another uh, theorem says that if the function never be zero, okay, then this equation has at most one solution in the in the this solution called a load one load uh, in this interval why the function never be the derivative never be zero means is always positive or always negative Why it has a uh, most of one solution? How do you prove that? We prove it by contradiction. That's a thing. You know, you, if you are true, if this is true, then blah, blah, blah. You know, if it's not true, blah, 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 you get the contradiction. This is the way you always argue with somebody, right? What do you say? If you say it's true, then blah, 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 you get it lead to some conclusion that it's obvious it's wrong, then so what you said is wrong, right? So this is argument. You always you have to use it. Right. So so how did more than that was root? Then you have a kind of contradiction, right? Okay? So we argue by contradiction. Okay, suppose okay, f of x1 equals f of x2 equals k, right? For two numbers. Then you apply the mean value theorem to this problem. Okay, then apply the mean value theorem to the function on the interval, right? And what do you get? You will get f of x2 minus f of x1 divided by x minus, right? The mean value system says that it's going to be the derivative, it's going to be f of two, right? And for, for some number in the interval, right? But I know this is going to be not going to be zero, right? Never be zero. It says that, right? By assumption, this part is by assumption. Okay, so that, what does that mean? That means the numerator never be zero. Okay. If the numerator is not zero, they're not equal. Contradiction. Okay, it is contradiction. Right, so this is argument. So when you argue with somebody, you disagree with what he said, you just assume what he said is true, and you find the consequence, conclusion, some kind of conclusion. It's obvious it's wrong. Then you prove that he said it's wrong, right? 
So I have a colleague, he was caught by policeman as a speeding ticket. So he went to the court and decided, somebody you're busy, not a bit. And what he did, he's driving on the meridian. I think he, policeman was waiting for some other cars and he, by his, the policeman saw that he's driving very fast. He makes a U-turn, coming back and trying to catch him, right? That's not. After he catches him, and others had already passed a couple of streets, right? So he's here and gave him a ticket. So he decided to challenge the policeman. He went to court. He asked the policeman, where did you make a car? Where did you see me, right? Okay, then, uh, okay, then you assume the policeman said, correct, right? How fast do you catch me well, when you drive? <laughs> the policeman gave me a speed. That's how I drive. Then he said, Judge, can you show, <laughs> give me a board? I'll show you the proof. And he did the massive competition. A court, if the policeman said it's correct, that's it was correct, right? And he never catch me. <laughs> that's a proof. Right. If he's right, you know, then it's dismissed. Okay. So don't argue immediately. You should ask him, give me the evidence, right? Tell me how fast do you drive. Catch me. If you don't know how fast you drive, how do you know how fast I'm driving, right? Even you cannot tell yourself how fast you're driving. Catch me. Right? So, so that's it. All right. Uh, I think it sometimes happens, probably there was a car driving very fast, the same type of car, right? It's in the night, you know, then when you make a U-turn, you already, another car, you know, you're following another car, not that same car. Yeah. Okay. Uh, okay, let's do the next problem. We're gonna plan this, okay? So show that x to the fourth plus 4x plus y equals zero has at least at the most uh, two rear loads. Oh, uh, that is a question. Okay, so some it's a, it's a it's a four polynomial degree four. Sometimes it has a four rear loads. Okay, now you have to prove that it's only 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 two. Okay, at the most there is only two. If some guy say I have a three loads, blah blah blah, then you have to argue with him, right? Why it's only at the most two rear loads. So I'm going to find the derivative first. Okay, the derivative is a is a three x cubed plus four. Uh, plus no, a four x cubed. Okay, 4x cubed. So this is going to be, uh, yeah, actually you can take this x out, uh, x minus x plus one, x squared minus x plus one, you know, okay? And this part is never be zero. It's always positive, positive, okay? This is always positive. Okay, it never be zero. Why never be zero? Because it's quadratic function, if you're trying to find a zero, and no solution, okay, then it's always it, at least at one point it's positive, so it's always positive. So this sign is determined by x plus one. So clearly, f prime x is greater than zero on the interval from negative one to positive infinity, right? F prime x is less than zero on the interval from negative infinity to negative one, right? Right? Why there's at most a two uh, zeros, two loads? Because on each interval, okay, on each interval, the function has always had a, the derivative have the same sign. So you have to, at the most have a one a real load, but then you also have to look at the f of a negative one. It's not a zero, okay? Otherwise, maybe you have a three. So negative one to the fourth power, four times negative one plus one, which is going to be negative two negative zero. So negative one is not a zero, okay? It's important. Then by 
by the above theorem, okay, f x uh, equals zero. Yeah, f of x is this one, right? This one has zero at least, at most, has at most one root in the interval from negative infinity to negative one. And also had a one more root and interval from negative one to positive infinity. And the negative one is not root. So that means it has most two roads over the whole line. Why? Because over each interval, the derivative is always positive or always negative. Right? So this in this can prove that this one has at most two loads on the neg for on this whole interval. Okay, negative one is not a root. Otherwise, if negative happened to be root, then then you can say it at most three loads. For example, if I modify uh, if I modify the problem like a g of x equals x to the fourth plus four x. Let me see plus three. Okay, and this one is slightly different. The difference is I change one to positive three. Okay. Everything else is the same. Okay. So g of x prime, uh, this is going to be positive on the interval from negative infinity to positive infinity, right? And g of prime is negative on the interval from negative infinity to negative one. So on each interval, g of x equals zero has only at the most only one root. Okay. But g of negative one is gonna be zero. Negative one is a root. So that includes that there's this conclude yeah, you conclude that g of x equals zero has at most three loads. Uh, on the interval from negative infinity to positive infinity, okay? okay? Because you can only prove it has one, at the most one load in each of the intervals from negative one, uh, from negative to positive infinity, from negative infinity to negative one, right? Then since negative one is also root, then you can say at most the three loads, right? Now, can you really find the root? Can you some further estimate? Yeah, let's go back to, yeah, this is my note. Okay, so let's go back to this function. And we have learned already the intermediate value theorem, right? I know f of negative one is going to be one minus four plus one is negative two, it's negative, right? So I look at the next value. Uh, zero. Okay, f of zero is going to be zero to the fourth plus four times zero plus one is positive. Okay. So by the mean variance theorem, uh, intermediate variance theorem, something not mean variance theorem, intermediate variance theorem. Okay. There is at least now this time at least one load in the interval from zero to from negative one to zero. Okay. Why? Because they have the same opposite sign. Okay. Now what you can conclude? You can conclude that. You can conclude that f of x equals zero has has exactly one load okay, in the end from negative one to positive infinity 
and uh, it is it is actually in in the interval from negative one to zero, right? Because the function is increasing. Okay. Now we can also look at f negative two. When I look at f negative two, negative two to the fourth power plus four times negative two plus one. Let's see what we get. This is going to be 16 minus eight plus one. So it's nine. Nine is greater than zero. Okay, F negative one is negative two. So that's why opposite sign. So then you can also say that by the intermediate variable theorem, okay, F of X equals zero has at least one load in the interval from negative two to negative one because they have the opposite sign, right? Opposite sign, one side is positive, the other side is negative. So you can, so you can conclude that there is at least, they have, a, a, this equation has exactly one load. In, the, in this interval, okay? In this whole line. And the load is in, in this interval. Happen, right? We can get better estimate. Okay. So intermediate variable theorem and uh, mean variable theorem combined can tell how many zeros exactly in the one interval, okay? Well, we go back to this function again, uh, g of x, okay? We, we already put a note, right? Uh, the g of x is gonna be x to the fourth plus four x plus, I put a three here, put a three here, right? Can we, And uh, this is a, let's study that. How many zeros we are going to get, okay? We, uh, we know, we based on above the computation, we already know that uh, uh, this is a whole line, right? It's x-axis, it's y-axis, here is negative one. So negative one is gonna be the loop g of negative one is gonna be negative one to the fourth power plus four times negative one plus zero, zero, right? I know over the interval from negative to infinity, there is at most one solution, right? Uh, from negative infinity has one negative one, okay? So that two intervals, it's harder to tell, but things, g of negative one is zero. So that means x plus one is a factor of g of x. Maybe we should factor, right? Okay, right, so let, how, do you, how do you factor a g of x if we already know x plus one is a factor? It's a long division. Okay, so you get x, x cubed. So x to the fourth power plus x cubed. 
Then you take the difference, okay? Then what you get should be get negative x squared. So negative x cubed minus x squared. Then you take the difference. So you get x squared plus 4x plus 3. Then here put x, x squared plus x, and the 3x plus 3. Then you 3, 3x three plus 3, so you get 0. So this is a quotient. Okay. What does that mean? That means uh, that means g of x, which is x to the fourth plus 4x plus 3, has the fact x plus 1. Okay. Then you look at this function. Now you want to study this function, right? With uh, how many zeros of it? Does it have a zeros? Because polynomial degree three must have a one real root, okay? So, and as, uh, so actually, yeah, if, if you let this function to be x cubed minus x squared plus x plus three, right? You, you want to see, use the mean value theorem, let's understand this function, how many roads you're gonna have, okay? So h prime x is gonna be three x squared minus two x plus one. Can you determine the sign of this when it's positive, when it's negative? And you look at this negative two square minus four times three times one, right? I think this is a negative. So that means it has no roots at all. Right? So this derivative is always positive. Okay? This is always positive for all x. Why? Because the derivative is going to be positive everywhere. Okay, if cannot be zero, if it's zero, then you can solve the quadratic equation. Then you get zero. So it's never be zero. It's always positive. So that means that means this one is always positive has at most one root in the interval from negative infinity to positive infinity, okay? So I'm very curious where it is. Because if it's positive means it's always increasing. So you cannot have a two loads, just only one, no where it is. And sometimes by guessing, try and find out. Otherwise, you can just determine the interval, to have an opposite sign, then, oh, this must be in that interval, okay? So you can try. When I try, you look at f of negative one. And I find out this is gonna be zero, okay? I was trying to look at negative one, zero, negative two, you know, the same. Okay, this is going to be negative one, minus one, minus one, plus three, which is zero, okay? So we're like x minus one is the root, okay? X minus one is the root. So what is that? Uh, you can divide the, then you can continue factor, right? So you can, you can have x cubed minus x squared plus x plus three, divided by x1 square. So I get negative two x squared plus 
square plus x plus 3, then minus 2x, I get a negative 2x square minus 2x, I minus 3x plus 3, and plus 3, okay? 3x plus 3, okay? Then you get 0. So that means this h of x is going to be factored to this. Okay? Okay, right, so finally, uh, we we can understand the function g of x equals x to the fourth power plus 4x plus 3 equals x plus 1, and x plus 1, so it's square, and x squared minus 2x plus 3. Okay, you're not able to factor this quadratic function again. But this example shows you you can use a sine of derivative to tell whether there is a one root or not. Usually that gives you the information there's no more than one root if the, if the derivative is always positive and always negative. Okay? So you get a, uh, yeah, this is always positive. Why? Because if it has zero, and then you try to use a sort of quadratic formula to solve it. You find out it has only complex roots, and there are no real roots. So this never been named. Okay, it's never been named. So this is a function. Uh, it says negative one is its root with multiplicity of two. Okay. Later on, we are going to learn how to draw the graphs of this type of function. Okay, and if you draw this graph, look at this graph. Okay, x equals negative one is the only root, but this is a never be negative, right? Always greater than equal to zero. So the whole function never be negative. So it goes like that. It's probably it's hard to draw, but uh, it looks like that. Okay. Yeah, when x equals so the function is always great. yeah for x to the fourth power plus four x plus three is always greater than equal to okay because the first factor is, is square the second factor is always positive. So we're using the mean value theorem to prove something to prove a, po uh, a polynomial, polynomial equation has most one root if the derivative is always positive over some interval, okay? We can use the intermediate variance theorem to prove exactly it has only one root, okay? If they have an opposite sign at two end points, then there is at least a one root. On the other hand, you can prove there is a most of one root, then combine them. And that's, that's only exactly only one root, okay? So for this part of the section, we have two type of problems. One lab is verifies the, the mean, uh, mean value theorem. Second is application of the mean value theorem to prove some equation has about, at most only one root. Okay, so finally, let's review this problem. I'm going to look at uh, uh, the third root of x on the interval uh, from, from zero to one, okay? Now, this function, yeah, verify the mean value theorem for this function, okay? Now, this function, is continuous on the whole interval, but uh, not differentiable by the end point, it's differentiable inside the interval. So this function has may satisfy the mean variance theorem. Assumptions in the mean variance theorem, it's okay. So we should have f of one minus f of zero. Okay, for some c is interval from zero to one, i by the mean variance theorem. Okay, let's check whether this is true or not. Yeah, it's guaranteed because it's a function 
continuous on the interval and the differentiable inside interval. Right? So this is going to be one, the derivative f. It's a zero to one minus. Right? So the derivative is one third. And uh, because f prime x is going to be one third x to the two, negative two thirds. So c to the negative two thirds. Okay. So question, how do you solve this equation? One equals one third c to the negative two thirds. How to solve this equation? Right. How to solve this equation? You multiply both sides by c to the two thirds, right? And then c to the two thirds equals one third. Right, times what? then c is going to be one third to the three over two. Okay. So this, uh, this is an indeed a number in the interval from zero to one, we are okay, yeah. The mean variable theorem holds for this particular function. 